Okay, so this is lecture 38 of ECE 5312. Okay, so in this lecture, what we're going to look at is we're going to look at a model for a tap delay line channel. Okay, so we, we kind of touched upon this before when we looked at multipath propagation. I talked a little bit about the Selene Valenzuela model for indoor multipath propagation. So this is a little bit more of a mathematical treatment using some of the terminology that we've looked at before, things like spreading factor, ah, you know, so like the Doppler spread, the multipath spread, coherence bandwidth, and all these other factors. We're going to see how all of these sort of play a role in terms of like, you know, can we develop a tap delay line? So if you're not sure what a tap delay line is, it's signal processing. Essentially, if you represent um, a filter or some sort, like, you know, basically you can represent some sort of FIR filter as a combination of unit memory delays and coefficients, right? So what, what happens is, like, you know, like in the Z transform, you have Z to the minus one. What is that? It's a unit delay. So imagine if you have a cascade of delays, and then in between every delay, you peel off the value, multiply by a coefficient, and then add for all those values that you pull off from each stage of that set of delays. You multiply by a coefficient, sum together. That's how you effectively create an FIR filter, right? And so that's called a tap delay line. Every tap, essentially, is that, well, why am I explain with my hands. Why not draw it? We've got the technology. Okay. So, yeah, I'm trying to like, oh, tap the ley line. No. Okay. Let's do it right. So, everyone should remember this thing, right? So what happens is the taps are these guys. So just like if any of you have gone, well, in Quebec, it's, a, it's almost like a way of life or a pastime. Um, you know, you go, you go um, what they call sugaring off. So you go into the countryside, you see all those maple trees, and then you drive a tap into the tree, and what you get is sap from the tree. Usually this is in the springtime coming out, and then you boil it to one, uh, you know, one percent of one percent of the original volume. So you basically make maple syrup out of it, right? So what happens is each one of these guys is a tap. So your delay line is this guy here. And what you're doing is you're tapping every stage of the delay line, taking a value, multiplying by a coefficient, and then summing everything together. This has the equivalent representation of an FIR filter, right? Which is nothing more than a collection of delayed coefficients that are applied to, you convolve against discrete time, some sort of input stream, right? So now if we go back to this guy here, what happens is what we want to do is we want to create a model that reflects you know, using this FIR concept to make something accurate. You know, in this case, what we're going to focus on is a frequency non-selective slow fading channel. And so parameters such as, you know, the Doppler spread multiplied by the multipath spread. So the spreading factor is way less than one, you know? So this, like, multiple angle thing here just means it's very, very small, much smaller than one. And that the signaling bandwidth should be way smaller than the coherence bandwidth, which means that all any sort of distortion caused by the channel, any sort of effects caused by the channel to the data is the same across all frequency in the transmission band, right? And then last but not least, the signal duration is way smaller than the coherence time, which means that um, anything happening to that signal duration is essentially being affected by the same sort of phenomenon, 
right? So we're talking about um, a, a signal that is essentially not being affected non-uniformly across frequency and time, right? From, from their perspective. And the question is, given, let's say, this specific case, how do we create a really cool mathematical model from this using this tapped ley line concept? And so what we do is, first of all, we want to represent everything in low pass. We don't want to deal, usually, OK, so in general, when we design communication systems, where do we do the processing? Do we do it at pass band? No. No, no, we always bring things down to low pass versions, right? To baseband. So what we need to do is any sort of signal model that, because, so think about where does the fading and the noise introduction occur? Pass band, right? And then it hits your antenna, it then goes down into your RF chain, then it gets down converted, blah, 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 blah several intermediate frequency steps, and then you're at low pass. What we need is, how does the fading and how does the noise look like at the low pass side of things? We know how the signal looks like at low pass because we transmitted it. But how does the distortion look like from a low pass perspective? Right? Especially since it got distorted in pass band. So first of all, what we want to know is sampling theory. So when we do perfect reconstruction, right? So we take samples and we want to convert back into a continuous time signal, right? How do we do it? We basically have a bunch of sync pulses, right? So first of all, if it obeys Nyquist sampling theorem, right? So we're not aliasing and such, and we pass those samples through um, essentially a sync pulse shape, right? Which is the problem. W what happens with a sync pulse? It goes on for infinity. But let's assume we have a magical sync pulse that does that, right? We have an infinite amount, um, infinite amount of memory. What should happen is we should be able to perfectly reconstruct the analog signal from, from those samples, right? And so what is this guy here? This guy here is exactly that. What happens is we're creating the low pass equivalent of the, um, of, of the signal from its discrete samples that are then multiplied with these shifted version of sync pulses that are summed together in order to create the original continuous time low pass waveform. Right? In the frequency domain, what does the sync pulse look like? It's a square wave, right? And so this, uh, or rectangular pulse. And so the frequency equivalent is essentially summation stays uh, this guy has no time variable, right? There's no t in that. So it's essentially some sort of constant, but there's definitely a t here and here. So this guy here is my sink. And so we take the Fourier transform. So what happens is this is now a sum of the Fourier transform of a bunch of time-shifted sinks. And what is time shift? That exponent, right? So, we, so what happens is we can look at it from the time domain, the td domain, or we can look at things from the frequency domain. And now we take one step look uh, a little bit closer because, because why, okay, so why am I doing this? Why am I like showing everybody, hey, this is digital signal processing. Here's the reason. So the one thing, the one thing that I did mention is the fact that if we look at any sort of distortion, we're going to have to look at it at the passband and then translate it back down to the uh, baseband signal. Here's the other thing. We need to sample it. So if we don't sample it correctly, we're going to lose stuff, right? So this is, this is what makes this problem very interesting. So what we're doing is we're working backwards. We take S of n, and we work backwards. So what is S of n equal to? Well, S of n is actually really equal to n, which is some sort of time index. And then we know what the spacing is between the samples, assuming a uniform sampling rate, right? And that's what the w is over here, right? And then what happens is we multiply by sync pulses and add them all together in order to reconstruct the low pass continuous time signal. Oh, OK. The next thing is, how does our channel distortion look like? Our channel distortion, in reality, 
is not discrete. It is also continuous time. It also occurs at bandpass frequencies. So what we've got is we take our low pass signal, this is low pass, modulate it to the desired bandpass signal. Oh, and the channel distortion, it's continuous and it's operating in the pass band region too. Ah, now what we do is once we have this, we've got it. Because what we will do is we'll try and reverse engineer it back into a discrete representation. So what ends up happening is we have this, what we call a time varying channel transfer function. So we throw in the T because over time, the channel will change. You don't realize it, but that wall is vibrating. You don't realize it, so is that ceiling. And there are other things that are vibrating too, like me. I'm moving all around. I'm changing the channel. <laughs> so, <laughs> just like at home, I'm always changing the channel. Uh, I forgot the name of that car insurance company, but like, do you think they can hear us? Turn off the volume! Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Anyways, um, I don't know why I'm seeing lots of them lately. So what we do now is now we begin plugging in this expression. So this is kind of getting messy, so let me clear the ink. What we want to do now is we want to take this guy and we plug him in here because we have him. That's our low pass equivalent. So what happens is this channel here, this is a low pass, well no, that's not a low pass equivalent channel. Bat, 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 bat. So what happens is, let me erase. Is there an eraser? I'll just clear it. So what happens is we take this guy, plug him in here. We have him. We, when we plug in, we notice that this does not depend on time or frequency. So he can be extracted out of this integral expression. Because, ah, oh, OK. So now I'm like wondering what the heck is going on. So what happens is I thought this was mod, uh, yeah, this is not modulation because we also would have to take the real of that if we're going to modulate to a frequency using a complex exponential, right? No one, no one, no one found that. Mm, shame on all of you guys. What happens is this is somehow the channel model applied to the low-pass equivalent data, right? And this is the inverse Fourier transform converting it back into a time domain representation. But this is basically convolution. It makes sense, right? You take the channel and you convolve it against this transmitted signal. And then uh, in the frequency domain, it's multiplication. And then you find the inverse Fourier transform, find the time domain representation. So if we do that and plug it in and isolate stuff, we get this expression here, which yields this guy. And lo and behold, when you have that, okay, what ends up happening is you, you get this expression. And if we now say that, let's, let's rewrite this guy here, okay? So we re rewrite him as Cn of t, okay? And so if we rewrite Cn of t as, like, you know, which originally represents sort of the time-varying ch uh, channel, right? But in this case, we have this n over w parameter, right, and 1 over w. What ends up happening if we, re we reinsert that into RL of t, what is this guy? FIR filter. Ta -da! So what we've basically done is we've gone full circle. What we've done is we've taken the discrete time baseband transmission, converted into continuous time, convolved it against the channel response, right? We, we basically then found the received signal Oh, okay. Now, let's see if we can find a discrete time equivalent of that. And what it turns out is what we get at the end of the day is a tap delay line. And so these CNs are the coefficients that are multiplied by this input signal. And so it's a bunch of coefficients multiplied against these guys, summed together to produce our output signal. And so how does that look like? Kind of like this. And these guys here are some sort of delay element, right? And so what happens is, 
you know, if you rewrite all of this, um, what you end up getting is, like, this is for, um, uh, for a frequency selective fading channel. And then you, of course, have your AWGN noise that's added in order to create your RL of T, right, which we saw before, and those signals. And then we throw in the noise for this, right? So now, um, you know, if let's say we use the, the weights that are complex valued stationary processes, what, what happens is there are a few slight changes, um, including the fact that now the CNs are going to be Gaussian random processes and statistically independent. Okay? So that's a little bit of a factoid. So the reason why I want to set this up in this manner. Because you notice that we have this kind of like FIR structure, this tap delay line structure. What I want to do now is there's a similar structure, which we call the rake demodulator. All right? You probably heard of rake receivers. And, and why, why do we call it a rake? Actually, I had a friend, when I was doing my master's, he was finishing up his. And he thought, like, you know, there were a lot of folks out there that I, I think what happens is, he began noticing how people were using their abbreviated names, you know, the first letter of their first name and the first letter of their last name combined together, maybe a middle initial, and spelling out things and stuff like that, right? So he was trying really hard to use his initials in order to come up with a new receiver structure, but never caught on. That's the thing. You know, like, why did turbo codes sound so cool? Well, this sounds so cool, right? Turbo codes or, or, or cognitive radio. You go to a psychologist, they'll say, cognitive what? You know, like, you know, and uh, yeah, 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 yeah. So, so here, what does rake mean? So how many of you have raked leaves or anything? No? Okay. So you two haven't. Oh, well, I'll bring you guys over to my house. There's lots of raking that can be done. So rake is essentially a, a garden implement. It depends, uh, but leaf rake. And it has these fingers, metal fingers. And what it does is it sort of, it's sort of uh, this big angular thing, this big web of metal fingers that you put on the ground, and it catches all leaves and moves it off your lawn. Otherwise, you have a very interesting lawn situation. Come spring, there's a lot of moldy leaves, very difficult to mold, all, all that. A mow, and it's just bad. The reason why we call it a rake receiver is it does exactly the same thing. It rakes the signal out of the air, right? Each one of the fingers takes a different copy of the signal and processes it independently, right? Rake receiver. My friend thought it spelt out the guy who invented the rake receiver, like R-A-K-E is probably two inventors there, like R-A and K-E, whoever they are, right? That's the, that's the other thing about fame. Like, like you know, we, we kind of know who invented turbo codes, right? But how about other things? Like, you know, like, who, like is attribution often correctly performed? Mm, sometimes not. Anyways, so the rake demodulator, what it does is it uses this tap delay line. So tap delay line, everybody should say, okay, yeah, I kind of get it. Essentially, I have this sort of like FIR structure. I have these different coefficients that I somehow derive. I have all these delay elements, and then I take the signal in, delay, process, delay, process, delay, process, in order to get some sort of received signal, right? What I'm going to do now is, Suppose we have this same sort of structure, but at the receiver, and we use it in order to extract information from the intercepted signal. So in order to achieve that, okay, what the, what's nice about the rake demodulator is the fact that each one of those fingers is, because they're independent, we can achieve some sort of diversity, right? So, you know, how is diversity achieved? So if we, like, let's say if you have L spaced out antennas by 10 wavelengths each, you essentially get uncorrelated reception at each one of the antennas. That's, like the, uh, that's what MIMO is all about. Beam forming, totally opposite. You want those guys as heavily correlated as possible. You want them within half a lambda or else. Correct? Yeah? OK. So in this case, what we want to do is let's say we look at both antipodal and orthogonal signals. OK? And let's say that the time duration is such that there's no ISI due to multipath, okay? So there's no ISI. So what does that mean? That the signal, each symbol period, is so long 
that even if you have a little bit of dispersion in the channel, it's almost like, you know, imagine if I talk like that in the, in the Grand Canyon, right? And there's a lot of dispersion in the Grand Canyon. You won't hear my echo because I'm still on the same vowel, right? So, so what, what happens is, let's assume that we, the symbol periods are way longer than any sort of delay spread. So, given that situation, and we saw this before, okay? Noise, and then here's our, each one of those, um, you know, in our um, tap delay line, that's a coefficient, that's a signal. If you notice, that's the amount that we delay each element by, by 1 over w, w, like me. <laughs> and what happens is we effectively represent this first part as v, i, t. That is our processed signal that has gone through that channel and been manipulated? No, that sounds too negative. Corrupted, yeah. Corrupted sounds like a good one. So, and then we assume that the noise is complex zero mean white Gaussian noise. Hey, complex Gaussian. So, what happens is our optimal demodulators consist of two filters that are matched, right, to V1 and V2. And V2, um, it is, it, it is, like, you know, we're assuming that these CKs are known. We know what the channel profile looks like. We know what the channel conditions are. Okay. So, what happens is, again, you, you see this guy here, right? UM. So, there's some sort of de decision variable that we are calculating at the receiver with respect to this system. So, we're assuming coherent detection of binary signals. We have a decision variable, right? The UM. It's equal to the real of the integral. So what we're doing here is we're correlating the VM. We're trying to see, is this the signal? Is this the signal? Is this the signal? And we're correlating each one of those potential signals against the RLT that we've intercepted. Correct? Yeah? Okay. So what ends up happening is we take these guys, we integrate it across C. So it's almost like, again, deja vu all over again. We're going like, 25 lectures ago, how do we calculate correlation? You take two waveforms, you multiply them, you integrate over their symbol period. We're essentially doing the dot product in the vector space. We're essentially taking how much one projects onto the other. We expand this out. We expand out what the VM star is, this guy here. And what ends up happening, if you do this for all M, right? Because this guy here is just one decision variable. We have m -ary modulation schemes, right? How's that going to look like? Isn't this a cool diagram? What happens is, this is what I mean by the rake fingers, right? Oh, I'm sorry. So it's not m, it's l. So what happens is we have l rake fingers. Oh yeah, that reminds me, I need to get a new pole for my rake. Because that's the thing, the problem about wooden rake poles is if you bend it too much, snap! You know, you have to get a new one. Anyways, that's on my to-do list for this weekend. So, what happens is, each one of these guys, what are we doing? It's almost the same as what we did before with the diversity combining, right? So what we're doing is, we multiply SL1 and SL2, complex conjugate, with the incoming signal, which is the Vs, right? So we do it with SL1, SL2, and all across the board. And then what we do is we have this C1 coefficient, C, uh, C2, C3, C4, all the way to CL minus 2, CL minus 1, CL. And we do it for both, okay, complex and, uh, uh, for both, for both um, uh, real and imaginary, right? Well, not real and imaginary, for both parts. And then what we do is we combine the respective components. We t so I'm, 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 this is getting messy. So we take this guy, we take this guy, we take this guy. We basically take that half and we sum it together, and then we integrate. And then we take this half, this half, this half, this half, sum it together, integrate, 
and then we do the difference of the two. Okay? Yep. What is the difference between the two branches? So one is um, multiplied with uh, SL1 star and the other uh, of T, and the other one is SL2 star of T. So and the, and and it's for uh, for all of them. So let me go back to the mathematics. Okay. So so let's um, ah okay. So here. So you have S L I, right? And so I is either one or two, right? And if we go further back. That's a good question, because I'm like get, kind of getting confused, too. <laughs> um, we defined this way before. <sighs> Maybe somewhere, perhaps. It should be somewhere. If, if not, it's, uh, I'll, I'll double check and Where? Oh, here. Yeah. That guy? Oh, M12, yeah. Yeah, so, <sighs> geez louise. I'm trying to figure out where, where that factors in. I'll, I'll, I'll look in. It's the second slide. Oh, is it on the second? Because that, that's the thing. I might, mm. Ah, OK. Yeah, I see it. So thank you. Yeah. Okay. So it's. Mhm. Mm okay. So, th so so well no, but that's that's oh okay. So S L means low pass, and then the I signifies which of the two. S okay. So it's one, which one of the two signals is being transmitted. So is it is it the first symbol or is it the second symbol? That's a low pass equivalent. Okay. Thank you guys. Ah. Phew. Otherwise, I wouldn't be able to sleep tonight. So. Okay. OK, so does everyone get that? So basically what we're doing is we're seeing, OK, is it SL1? And we have all those coefficients, and then we add it together. We integrate those guys. And we do the same thing with the SL2 and do the same thing. We subtract one from the other, and then we sample into the decision circuit. All right? And so how does this guy perform? And so. As you can imagine, this is going to be a little bit tedious, so I'm just going to briefly go over it. All right. So what happens is, is that with the rake demodulator performance, so we assume very slow. So we're not having like rapidly time varying type of fading, right? So we're not at traveling in a vehicle going 100 miles per hour down some interstate. Yeah, we, we, no one drives 100 miles per hour down any interstate, right? So, and I see everyone smiling like, oh yeah, I saw that pickup truck this morning. So. What, so as a result, why do we care that the channel doesn't vary all that quickly? Maybe not at all in the observation window, because then we perfectly know what the Cs are, right? All those coefficients. So if we now go back to our decision variable, right? And we, and we sort of revisit, like, what is that RL of T? What's our low pass equivalent received signal? We have these guys. Notice that the T is gone from the Cs, right? So there's no time variation with respect to the channel coefficients. It's totally static. We're making that assumption, right? And same thing there. So now what happens is if we look at this guy again and plug him in there, we get this very messy, huge expression down below. Whoo, that's bad, right? Not to worry. Because what happens is if we, okay, so first of all, we make the assumption that these guys, SL1, so low pass version of signal 1 and low pass version of signal 2, we assume that they're wide band signals, okay? And they're generated from pseudo random sequences. So why do we care about them being pseudo random sequences? Because they don't correlate. Like, you know, if we take the dot product, which is equivalent to integrating the product of the two multiplied together, they should be approximately zero. That's what we hope. We hope that they don't have any correlation. Now, plugging it back in and assuming binary antipodal signals, 
we get this guy at the bottom, right? So u1, right, is our first decision variable, and it looks like a maximal ratio combining decision variable, right? And we saw that alpha is equal to the magnitude of the co co channel coefficient, and n is equal to all this stuff, all these integral stuff that we just sort of compact and say, n, this is noise, it, something happened to it, right? So we just sort of say, we just compact it all into a single variable. Now, if we want to find the error performance, just like before, what we want to do, let's say we do this for binary, antipodal, and orthogonal signals. So we're looking at either like a BPAM or a BPSK, that's 180 degrees phase difference from each other, or some sort of orthogonal signaling like FSK, right? So if we take that, so what happens is we know what the probability of error expressions are, right? And we also know, like let's say if we take, like, you know, so what is this? This guy here, that's some sort of signal to noise ratio. It's going to be epsilon over n naught, the signal energy of every path divided by the noise density, and then the sum of all these sort of weighing factors, right? And these guys, uh, if we do this, like let's say we rewrite it as a summation of these gamma k's, right? So each one of these alpha k squared multiplied by these constants, we call a gamma k, right? So gamma k is equal to epsilon over n naught alpha k squared. And what happens is this turns out to be chi squared with two degrees of freedom. We know what the characteristic function is. We know that they're independent with each other. So you know where this is going, right? We have a sum of these suckers. If we find a characteristic function, so we, let's say we take the e, the expectation of e to the sum of all these chi squared with two degrees of freedom, what do we get? We get the product of all their individual characteristic functions. Ah, and that gives us this guy, right? So if we now go back, we know that the PDF of this sort of, of, this sort of concatenation. So what happens is if we take the inverse Fourier transform of the characteristic function, it gives us a PDF. So this is a trick to get a PDF of a very, very messy situation. If you have like n IID random variables that are summed together, what do you do? Your instinct should be run after the characteristic function. If you do that, you'll see that the math will go down a path that if you take the inverse Fourier transform, will give you this PDF, and then you know what's going to happen. You can find what the probability of error is from that. And the way you find the probability of error is you have now the PDF, right, and you find what the error condition is and you solve for it. And that's what we have here. Here there's an approximation. So um, as exercise for students, although I doubt you're going to read this, um, but if you're interested and you need something to fall asleep on, so in our course textbook in Paracas and, Manal uh, Paracas and Salehi uh, Digital Communications 5th Edition, section 13.5, check it out. There's a lot of cool reading, a lot of mathematics that you should not miss out on. So with that, um, that concludes uh, lecture 38. Okay. So what we're going to do is we're just going to go all out and try and do lecture 38.